Hi everyone, <coughs> to another seminar. Okay. Today we have Toke Paulin Jorgensen from Carlsbad University in Sweden. He's a PhD student right now and he's uh, been involved in the Buffalo community for two years and is also the author of the Netflix rapper, The Spider Community. So I'll let Toke introduce himself a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'll be speaking a little bit about queue management and show you some measurement results and talk about a little bit about this testing tool that I've used to obtain these results. Um, but first, uh, a, a little primer on the Buffalo issue. So how many of you actually have heard of this before? Oh, great. That's almost the entire room. Excellent. Um, I just so to make sure we're all on the, uh, on, the, on, the same, on the same page for this. So buffer bloat is, is, is basically what happens when you have a bottleneck in the network and um, and you queue up packets to um, to go from one speed to another and this can induce latency and the bloat comes from when these buffers are so so big that you can get seconds of queuing uh, in this instance and this is an example of it where um, you'll see some more of um, of, of these. Uh, a bit later on, but, but just a, a, a quick preview of, of the kind of things we're seeing here. After five seconds, this is a, a ping measurement basically, and after five seconds we have eight competing TCP players starting up going over the same domain. Mm -hmm. And as this happens, we see the latency just climbing up to about almost a second of induced latency, going from the almost nothing that was there. These, these are three computers just networked together on over a, a local, local Ethernet network. And this is the, this is the uh, on the default configuration in Linux you can you can see behavior like this, and and managing the queues is one of the things you can do to um, to 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 help this problem. And I'll I'll get back to that in just a second. First, uh, you've heard most of this before. I'm originally from Denmark, but I'm currently in uh, doing my PhD in Sweden. Um, here, this is. Uh, Stockholm is over here, Oslo here, rest of Europe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it's a little bit, uh, the university is quite small, about 16,000 students, 1,200 staff. It's, it's sort of a rural town in the middle of the big forest of Sweden. Um, we have a computer science department of about 40 people, and I'm in the distributed systems and communication group um, of, of these, these are the three research groups that we have at the university. Uh, we do various national EU research projects, and the CS department has also been appointed sort of a strategic research area for the university. So there's quite a lot going on. There's a lot of people coming in. It's, it's small, but but things are happening, and, and that's pretty cool. Um, look at queue management. So um, there's a there's a little bit of um, of, of, of confusion of terms in this area, where um, what I call and what most people in the academic community call AQM algorithms are algorithms that will start dropping packets in the queue before it's full in some some hopefully intelligent way. But for some people, that also the AQM term can can encompass a larger uh, area of technology. So I'm trying to to use this smart queue management term to encompass uh, anything that's smarter than just having a first-in, first-out queue. So that can be AQM algorithms, AQA, a, or which I hear mean any, anything that drops packets before the queue fills up. You can also have things like furnished queuing or other forms of scheduling algorithms. Um, and then you can have shaping and prioritization building. And the uh, the Cellwit firmware, which is one of the things that came out of the, uh, of the bus build project, has this module that can configure all of this for you um, to put on your home data and, and use some of these technologies. I'll mostly be talking about HUM and Spanish queuing in this talk. Uh, the others are more tools that you can use to configure to make sure that you're actually shaping what you want to shape. Over the last couple of years, there's been some new HUM algorithms that come out. The original and best, well, not so much best. The original algorithm, uh, random early detection, which you've probably heard about, is from somewhere in the 80s. And so that's been around forever, but it's not really been used so much. And, and it's, it's, of course, it's, it's difficult to, to really uh, get data on this because operators may not be want to, to, to tell you. But, but it's, it's widely thought that it's not 
it's not really used in the internet today. And the main reason for this is that it's really hard to configure. There's a lot of knobs you can tune for this algorithm. And if you tune them wrong, it completely kills your link. Um, so, so what happened is we just have dumb FIFO queues everywhere. And then about two years ago, uh, Kathy Mitchells and Ben Jacobson uh, came up with this new algorithm called Coddle Control Delay. And what that does, the main, the main innovation in this algorithm um, is that instead of trying to guess at queuing and look at queue lengths and drain rates and so on, it just timestamps packets when they come into the router and then it measures the delay when it sends them out. And if that queuing delay then gets too high, and if it stays too high for a while, it will start dropping packets. And then there's this control law that will uh, try to figure out how many packets to drop, how fast, and so on. But the main innovation of this thing is to just measure the delay and react to that. The year after, last year, uh, this other algorithm, Pi, came out of Cisco. Uh, where what that does, it tries to uh, do a bit of the same thing, but it does it by looking at the queue length and drain rate, and then up periodically it updates the drop probability so that it's a bit, it's more similar to what you would see in a in a red algorithm where you have a a random drop on ingress, and that's then updated in a more dynamic way. That's the sort of weight uh -huh. sum between the current and the historic drain rate and queue length. And then uh, some people have been trying to give the adaptive red, which is maybe not so new. That's the reason why I have new in quotation marks. But but it's it's been some people have been trying to give the adaptive red algorithm a bit of a renaissance to try to see how does that compare to some of these new algorithms. And the adaptive thing is just refers to the fact that this is a scheme to dynamically adjust uh, the the red drop probability from the average Q size. So it. it takes away some of the parameters you have to tune for the red algorithm and tries to set them for you. So that's to refresh our memory for the code So uh, if it stays high, you drop, what do you drop? You drop incoming packets or? You drop on DQ. So when it when a DQ is a packet, it will get it from the queue and look at the timestamp. And if it's over a, uh, if, if, if the difference between when it came in and when it's going out, if that's over, by default, that's a tag of five milliseconds. Um, and so the packet's been already buffered, and, and then you drop yes, the it's, it's, when it, it's when it's being sent out. So the idea is not to but try. It, make it's not to sense. save. The idea is not to save queue space. The idea is to signal the TCP to slow down. Mm -hmm. So you want to, and it also does, it does head drop of the queue instead of tail drop. So you want to drop the packet so that um, the next packet that comes out will then you will get a duplicate act for the TCP connection. And the TCP so you keep the statistics for TCP session then for for the delays, and you can you can jump in obviously. This is your Sorry, no, it's just talk. I, I oh, you can take it offline because maybe it's not really that. But it's the much more complex. It's not a hard rate memory. Yeah. It starts thinking about dropping at five milliseconds. It, it will start dropping at a hundred milliseconds of delay, and gradually, as as it, until it hits that five millisecond target, gradually drop more and more packets. Right. Yeah, I, I delighted that on the slide, but there's this reverse square root law that will drop packets faster and faster until the until the delay gets under control. Okay, anyway, so we'll so try to tune may not be that we'll try to tune the delay, there's a feedback loop. Um, um, okay. Yeah. But they're gonna head drop <coughs> you're gonna lose the bandwidth on the wire, right? We'll get to that. I have uh, that's one of the things um, we're looking at. And, not, and 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 the short answer is not necessary, sure. uh, but we'll uh, we'll see that. That's some of the results I'm going to show you is, is some comparison of these different algorithms. Yes, and the time stamping of packet that's a requirement. How widely available is it in like different processors? Just do you have any study regarding that? Well, it runs in Linux. Um, these are implemented yeah. in Linux, but of course you do need a truck source. Yeah. Uh, of of so fairly simple. high granularity. Yeah. So Seems like the hardware is um, so not modern. It, it runs on on various architectures. It runs on MIPS, on ARM, on x86. Uh, but 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 I think what, one of the reasons that Cisco came up with Pi is that it doesn't run on Cisco routers because they don't they don't they they, they want to be able to retrofit an algorithm into their existing silicon. Right. And I'm not. A, Big expert in big bug routers and hardware, but as I understand it, what they can do is they can use this Pi algorithm to feed into the existing uh, hardware implementation of Red uh, because that already has the random drop thing. 
So it's, so this can actually be retrofitted. So the timestamping thing is quite easy to do in software, but it has been one of the things uh, that that has made this algorithm. Some people say that they have trouble implementing this in that platform, um, and I've mostly been looking at, at Linux. So so it's it's nah, I, I get to that part. The other family of algorithms I've been looking at are the fairness of flow queuing, so scheduling algorithms, and, and what they do is various ways of splitting up packets into their component flows. And a flow can be many things. By default in Linux, a flow is the five tuple of source and destination, port and IP, and then the IP protocol number. Um, but, but you can configure them to basically hash on anything. But the idea is it uses hashing, hence the stochastic Spanish queuing. So it hashes uh, this byte tuple into a configurable number of buckets, and then it has a separate queue in each bucket. And then you would get a round robin D queue, so you would get separate queues. And the first one of these was described, uh, the implementation was described way back in 1990 by Paul McKinney. And that's, this, that's the symbol hash into buckets, do round robin per packet D queue of these things. Um, then a couple of years later, the, an addition to this was, was published which is called a deficit round robin. So the SFQ, the most normal stochastic kind of queuing, will get you fairness on a per packet basis. basis. But if the packets are different sizes, this uh, that screws the actual throughput. Um, so what, what DRR does, the deficit round robin, it keeps a deficit each time it queues a packet and, and tracks that over um, subsequent DQ so that you approximate byte fairness by, if, you only, if you're only sending 500 byte packets, you're going to get three of them through each time the other flow that's sending 1500 byte package gets one. Thing. So that uh, deficit round robin was then built into this thing called FQ cuddle, which is in current Linux now. And what that does is it takes the deficit round robin and then it adds an optimization for sparse flows. So that the first time a new queue appears, the first time a packet comes in and hashes to a bucket that doesn't have a queue in it. Uh, currently, it will get temporary priority for this queue until it's it's done its quantum of bytes that come through, and then will be put back in the queue and do the normal line button. And and the subtle thing about this is that if if the flow then goes away, uh, if it if it drains if the queue drains completely, then when it comes back, it will be prioritized again. And hence, it's not just new flows; it's sparse flows. So anything that's sufficiently um, for a very fuzzy notion of sufficiently. Sparse, but but things like your voice traffic, your pings, your DNS lookups, your TCP SYN packets, all these things will get automatic priority. And then what FQ Coddle does, the Coddle part is that it then puts the Coddle algorithm on each of these subcues. So you get this sort of hybrid scheduler HRM thingy, um, which is in, <coughs> in, in, in current apps. So I'm going to show you some results for <coughs> testing some of these algorithms. And this very basic setup is what I'm using to test these. These are just five regular computers. Um, they used to be lab computers at the university, and then I scratched them and put in dual NICs and set them up on this nice basic chain setup. And they all run Debian Linux, except I updated the, the kernel to be fairly recent. At least it was fairly recent six months ago. Um, so you get Things starting from the client going to the server, and then you have these two Linux boxes being uh, bottleneck routers where you can configure these AQM algorithms and test them out and do software rate limiting via the token bucket folder to, to get the link speed you want to test. And then in the middle here, uh, I use dummy net to hold on to the packets for a while so you can simulate different um, propagation delays. And that's all the basic, the basic test that I've, that I've been using to test these algorithms. And then what I've been doing with this is I've been testing uh, steady state behavior of the algorithms. Uh, the main test to do that is called the real-time response on the load test, which uh, this gentleman here um, described some years ago. And what that does is that was, uh, you saw a, a, the, the graph you saw in the beginning was, and it was from a test like this. So to start up some, some latency measurement, there's normal UDP in I'm oh, sorry, ICMP ping, you would run normally, and then in addition, some UDP latency measurements. And then five seconds later, it will start out four um, TCP flows going in each direction. So the idea is to load up the link 
as much as you can and then see what happens. Blow up the network, basically. And it does blow up the network. This can saturate any link from a megabit to 40 gigabits quite reliably if you find it. So that's sort of the idea. Look at what happens when that goes on. And then also look at VoIP one-way delay um, while also running this test. So see what happens when the link is completely saturated and how does your VoIP flow then react. And the same thing with the web pages. Try to retrieve or do two different web pages, a very simple one and a very big one, and see how does that react um, when you have competing traffic. How does that work? Then I also look at interflow fairness. So I, uh, TCP is known to be unfair when the RCTs um, differ. Mm. And I make them differ quite a lot here. Um, so four different flows to four different destinations with different runs of times, and then measure the, mm. the throughput of okay. these flows against each other com and compute fairness indexes and these indexes. And then I look at the transient behavior, so what's the latency development over time from when the competing flows start up. How does how does how how quickly do the algorithms react and keep the the, the latency under control? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah. I'm not familiar with the RUL, but as I understand it, uh, many video players you know, they they're effectively greedy receivers and they want to keep a buffer at a certain depth. Do any of these these tests sort of approximate to that kind of behavior? You're thinking about Netflix and for example, and that sort of thing. For example, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what they do is, uh, it's called Dash, uh, when you try to standardize it at least. And what they do is they will, um, the, the player on your machine will retrieve 10 second chunks of the video over HTTP. So you will get, uh, and, and that will be sent as fast as it can go. Right. Right. So it's, it, it's not, it's, it's one of the things that I've wanted to add in here, but I don't have it directly. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a bit like a big web page retrieval, except it's only one flow. So it's um, but it's it's very bursty and it, it will um, it will try to max out the link right. for each flow. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons they're doing this is that the network is too unreliable, so they can't just stream it. Right. Um, so, so they can't try and keep a minute or whatever local to the player. To yeah, the and then it, and then it will also do try to get for each chunk. It will try to find it, it may switch bandwidths and frame mm -hmm. rates and all these sorts of weird stuff. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's on the to-do list. I'd good, say. Good. <laughs> I think the point is that is that you know thanks to to you guys working some other you know, and changes in networks, they, they actually look at their at their buffer and if and if, the, if their buffer is filling up and reaching a high water mark, then they don't request as much stuff. And the buffer is the buffer is too small, then they request more stuff. They actually look at the, that how much they look at the playback buffer and they yeah. say, well, why don't they just get as much as they can? And the reason is. A political slash legal reason that the <laughs> studios will only let them buffer a certain amount of the movie. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> also and so it's a technical it. solution to a legal problem, but it's, it's still is something that everybody has who watches Netflix. Yep. <clears throat> right. Um, yes. Moving on, the scenarios I tested this in. Uh, there's three different bandwidth settings. These are meant to approximate a fairly wide range of residential connections as you would have on your DSL link or your cable link or so on, down from the asymmetrical 10 megabit down, 1 megabit up link like what my clients have, uh, and then up to about two symmetrical 10 megabit links and 100 megabit links. 50 milliseconds base latency over the path, and I run cubic TCP on them, and then I test all these algorithms. And these are the ones you saw before, except FQ no column is um, FQ cuddle with the cuddle algorithm turned off. So mm -hmm. to, to try to get an idea of uh, how much of the benefit from this algorithm is from the scheduling and how much is from the AQR. And then we run the FIFO fast, which is the default on the FIFO Q and Linux as a baseline. Parameterization, uh, I won't go through all of this. Just note that uh, once in italics is the default, I try to keep it, these, these algorithms are meant to be knobless, so I try not to tune the knobs that are actually there. Um, there's some um, <coughs> some deviations from this. I try all the algorithms that don't have, that only have the queue is full as a drop parameter. I try to give them the same amount of space in the queue. So that's these here, 127. Um, and error doesn't really have defaults. And uh, Cardle is known to break down if the um, target it's trying to achieve is less than the physical time it takes to send one packet. Over the link, and at one megabit, that's about 13 milliseconds. Of 
Um, but that's more for, for reference if you want to try and repeat some of this stuff. Now, I've borrowed a little bit from Sergio Leone in uh, framing these results. So you're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the good is the, uh, the steady state results. Um, so this is the result at the 10 1 megabit per second link. And uh, this slide usually takes a bit of explanation for this plot type. What you see here is on the uh, vertical axis, you have the uh, mean TCP grid put as measured at the application there. So you can't necessarily go from this to link utilization because there's a lot of overhead that's not accounted for. But since we're just trying to compare the different algorithms, uh, we don't care. And the reason why there's two clusters is that it's an asymmetrical link. So this is the upstream direction, and this is the downstream direction. And then on this um, scale, you have a inverse induced latency scale. So inverse because we want up and, up and to the right to be better. Mm -hmm. And induced latency <laughs> just means that we subtract the base path latency. So the, um, the best you can achieve is zero. So that's just no, no added mm -hmm. And then finally, each of the dots is the median value over uh, 30 test repetitions. And then the ellipses around each of the dots is a measure of the variance for, uh, for the measurements. And the, the angle of the ellipse uh, indicates the direction of covariance between Griffith and Git. So, so much that's the, the technical part. Then what you see here uh, is in terms of results is um, first, FIFO sucks. You will get um, almost 300 milliseconds. And bear in mind, this is this is actually with a shorter queue than what the default and like that. The default is a thousand packets, so you would be out here somewhere. Um, <coughs> but you still get about 300 uh, milliseconds of induced latency for five or five. The uh, the AQMs, these the the new AQMs control it quite well, and actually. Um, as as the, you, you asked about the, the throughput before, they actually get slightly higher throughput um, because they uh, you will get if if you don't have them for five or fast, you get a big ramp up of TCP speed and then a big and then a bunch of drops when the queue fills and then it will slow down and take a while to come back up. Mm -hmm. So the accurate throughput is actually worse. And when you the atriums, what they do is they they make the um, order of the time of, of feedback that the, that the sender TCP gets a lot shorter, so they can more accurately approximate the link speed. And that means that you get actually, in some cases, you get higher throughput when you put something smaller than a fiber in there. And you can see you get uh, about 50, between 50 and 100 milliseconds with the Pi and Trouble Economics and themselves. AWED, even better latency, but it comes at, at, at a cost in throughput. And what happens here is actually. AWED is fairly aggressive in its drops. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you lose throughput here is that on the upstream direction, you can see they all uh, they all fit are quite the pretty much the same throughput in the upstream direction because the link is so slow that it's just filling up. And there's always packets going through. But um, what happens with AWED is that it starts dropping X because it has a fairly high random drop thing and it'll hit it'll it'll drop the axe from the from the downstream close. And that will kill the throughput of the of those guys. So that's why you see this one being lower at this speed. You'll see in the <coughs> you must have uh, you might have mentioned what's the degree of multiplexing here? How many flows are there currently in the downstream and downstream direction? Four in each. Four. So so these are the aggregate throughput of all four flows in each direction. And, and then the latency is measured for the competing this does the competing pain and UDP uh, measurement plus. So what are the traffic characteristics? I mean, is this like real traffic? Or it's uh, it's network. So okay. it's uh, it's a synthetic, infinitely large TCP transfer, basically. So we go on. We configure it to send as much data as, as it but can. But I mean, in terms of the packet size distribution or which have any as big as they go. It's just a box TCP transfer that I would have to download. So they all the TCP packets all the fifteen hundred bytes. Um, going back all of them? Yes. Sir. Well not the axe. Not the axe. No, no, not the axe. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's just trying to get as much data data to it as it can. So I, I guess the question is, you know, is this synthetic benchmark like you know representative of, of real use? Yeah. And how, I was going to my follow up. Thing, but yes, thank you. Um, and we'll get to that. Not necessarily, um, but there's some. I try to run it, run some realistic um, 
traffic scenarios on top of this. So this is the baseline. We kill the link and see how bad it gets, and then we try to run applications on top of that. So it's a, it, it is a, a way to um, you're right. It, it's a way to try to to uh, elicit the worst behavior we can out of this link. To, to, so it's a sort of proof of existence. Mm -hmm. so for example, you had line rate traffic with minimum size packets, for example. No, I mean, it, it, and it actually depends on the mix of the traffic, right? Because you have a reverse versus like, if you have like small packets, obviously, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard on the, on the processing, but this particular oh, scenario reacts. looks like a bit like BitTorrent in its first phase. BitTorrent typically has six flows up and six flows down. Okay. Uh, and we actually have models for that, but it's, it's easier to do for. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But I'm also interested in the in the, uh, in the um, structure of, of each flow in terms of how it looks like and so like it's like distribution mm -hmm. right? because that's what really affects the queue, yeah. right? Because like ten ten packets. Oh, that's true. Yeah, there's a huge distribution of packet sizes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, bigger bigger yeah. packets will make the effect worse. Yeah. Around those yes, but it depends on how they arrive. These big packets, right? You have like twenty of them arriving, you know. From one after the other versus like you know five and then you have small packets and yeah. another five. Yeah. So I'm saying it, it, it can have all different types of combinations. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or anyway, but it yeah. sounds like you, have, you you never get an end of segment for you. So you you have 1550 they just keep running. You, yeah, that's uh, what I understand. And so I think if you looked at it from an IMIX perspective, it would be larger than you know if you go look at one of the right. providers, the IMIX that we would see in a yeah. you know, more. Typical but I'm not sure how realistic that is. But anyway, yeah. Um, but as I, I have some some stuff from some some work flows and some some web flows as well. But but you're right. It's uh, it's definitely a, a on purpose trying to uh, be as bad as we can. Um, and and what you're saying about the all of that actually uh, I was I was coming to that up here. These are the scheduling algorithms, and what they do, they each flow gets its own, so it gets way better mixing. Um, and and you can see that it's almost. From, from the from the point of view of the of the latency measurement flows, mm -hmm. they don't notice the uh, the bulk PCPs at all because they will get priority and they will get, and you will get mixing from the round wrapping mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the difference between the SFQ and the FQ carbon and non carbon flows um, is that uh, you have this sparse flow criticization for the FQ carbon versions, and that means that the measurement flows get priority, whereas here they have to go a, a whole round in the round wrapping phase. This is a bit of thought is that perhaps something like Pi is sort of optimized for a different data point, like where maybe you have yeah. many thousands of flows or rather than just yes, four. That is uh, I'll I'll get back to some of the uh, some of, of the scenarios that this may or may not work in. Um, and then finally this thing is actually the, the line here is actually the ellipsis around F2 no uh, and what happened is that is you're looking at a hash collision. So in one of the 30 measurements, one of the measurement flows happened to be hashed into a bucket. Uh, that also had on the bug flows, and then suddenly it's all really bad uh, latency behavior, and then you get and, and that translates here into a, a large variance of latency. So that's why you have this this weird thing. Um, at 10 megabits per second, you get um, about the same picture. You get a bit more variance in in the variables because you're not hitting the one megabit upstream so hard. Um, and, and this difference is a little bit smaller because it takes it doesn't take as long to do a, a round robin thing in the in the scheduler. And A red is not too aggressive anymore uh, compared compared to the others because it's, it, it behaves better on the other standard. And then finally, at 100 megabits per second, you will see high and low switching uh, switching places. And code is definitely uh, some way from achieving its five millisecond target in this instance. And unfortunately, I don't really have a good explanation for this, other than um, we're pounding the link so hard that Carver can't keep up. But there's, uh, Dave says he has some, some variants that might be better. Uh, but at least in this instance, and what's in, in mainland Linux today does struggle a little bit. And it still can keep up. by so fast out the door. It still does that. That mm -hmm. is definitely true. And the other algorithms are, are convertible. <coughs> Then moving on to some of the uh, other traffic mixes. Uh, what you see here is a, a cumulative distribution of the one-way delay as experienced by a, a simulated VoIP flow or emulated VoIP flow going next to the traffic. And what's interesting, you see the sort of same sort of distribution, FIFO all the way out here and the others. But what's, what's interesting here is the 95th percentile. 
where again you see um, FQ no cuddle and SFQ, which is just the normal round robin things here. Certainly get a lot of latency again, that's a hash collision. So you get if your flow happens to go into the same bucket as one of the um, one of the bot flows, then you're going to see quite bad latency. Whereas FQ cuddle here, that has the cuddle with on, on each of the buckets. So even so so that actually manages it still has a bit of a spike, but it does manage to control the latency somewhat. So that even even though as you saw before FQ no cuddle actually gives you more throughput than putting the kernel there, having it might be um, a, sort of a way to safeguard against hash collisions and also to make sure that the bot flows themselves experience better latency. Because bear in mind, none of these latency measurements are actually looking at the TCP packets. We don't, uh, I, ju I just assume that they're a bot flow and we don't care for each individual packet how long time it spends in the queue. We just want to put and we just want it to put. Um, but if you're doing things like X11 or RDP or something that goes TCP or streaming video or something like that, where you actually want low latency but also can bog up the flow quite a lot, then you want the um, the queuing time of the individual TCP flows, even though they're bug flows, to be controlled. And to do that, you need some sort of, of HRM on that flow as well. Um, and again, you see from, for the white flow, you also see cuddle and pi switching places between the bandwidths. And even at 100 megabits, you don't want to uh, be on the phone out here with 100 milliseconds of one radio length for the white packets. And then we have a web traffic issue. And, and this is just one of those I, I ran. And this is the front page, a mirror of the front page of the Huffington Post, which is, I think it's about three and a half megabytes of data. Uh, over 150-ish requests, so it's quite a bit, uh, quite a big page. Um, and what this tells you is that if you're doing that at 10 megabits with a lot of background traffic, it's going to take you eight seconds to read the hubbing um, But what this also tells you is that in this instance, you're not actually getting better performance per se for the finished curing algorithms as, uh, as compared to the HRMs. So it's, it's just to illustrate that it is very much, as, as some of you have, have already noted, it is very much dependent on the traffic scenario of what you look at and, and which algorithm would be the best for you. But still, they all pretty much beats um, the default type of fast. But this is, this is one of, one sort of a, an attempt to try to, to put in um, realistic traffic scenarios in the mix. Right. Um, moving on. So the reason the steady state was the good is that you can actually do something about the steady state. You can actually get quite a lot, quite a bit better behavior from these algorithms, especially the HMs. What you see here is the fairness results, where where you don't necessarily see that. Um, so this is um, Jane's fairness index computed over. You uh, remember from the from before the test uh, scenario, you have four different flows. Uh, 10, 50, 200, and 500 milliseconds of RTT. And then this is Jane's Spanish in, index um, computed over those, the total throughput of those flows. And what, you, what the interesting thing to note here is that um, you get a drop in fairness when you put in an HRM. So you, you exacerbate TCP's tendency to work on fairness by putting in an HRM. And what you also see is uh, one is perfect fairness. So the round robin schedulers, the pure round robin schedulers, can actually they live up to that. In the fairness queuing, they actually provide enforced fairness between the flows. Um, they can't quite queue up at 100 megabit, and that's something to do with the queue not being quite long enough for some of the flows to to actually fold out the full uh, bandwidth that they provide. And if we look at the reasons for this, and look at the individual flow throughputs. What you see is that the AQMs almost kill the 500 millisecond flow completely. And there's two reasons for this. One is that um, when you look at the um, when you look at the packet jumps for the TCP flow, you'll see that the what the AQM does is that it makes the drops that's less burst, so it evens out the drops over um, over the test ratio. So on, on, on FIFO, you would get the queue would fill, and then you would drop maybe three or four packets, and then the queue would fill. And, and TCP 
does a better job of recovering from these varsity losses than it does in having nice, nicely spaced even losses. The other reason why you see so bad behavior for the very low long attitude flows is these algorithms are designed to operate at a point that is quite a bit lower than half a millisecond. So they are designed to operate at around 100, 200 milliseconds of flow RTT. So they tune to that, and especially because they, they do do they, they do try to tune to the cue behavior they see, but because they share the bottleneck with low RTT flows, they tune to this, and then they just completely mode up the 500 milliseconds flows, and they get almost no packet through, and you get this um, low times in the and then at one megabit per second, you see a bit of the same behavior. Uh, here, the, um, as I said before, the, the uh, fairness clearing algorithms actually can keep up and keep the fairness um, quite even. And then you see this weird thing where some of the algorithms actually get lower throughput by um, now for, for the 10 millisecond round trip time flow. And I don't really know why. Um, <laughs> other than, and, and it's, it's a bit weird. Um, but um, yeah, so I think uh, to go back to your previous slide, um, I mean, if you if you think about sort of from for the, the conceptual aspect from the theory of TCP, um, I don't think it's the case that drop tail uh, RTT unfairness is supposed to be better with drop tail dropping rather than sort of probabilistic or red light dropping. It's actually. I think it's actually like, you know, it's squared RTT unfairness. You know, you have drop tail dropping, and you get it goes toward linear RTT unfairness if you do probabilistic. What I would guess actually is happening here is so that 500 millisecond versus 10 milliseconds is is induced delay. It has nothing to do with the queue. When you run FIFO, your queues are a lot bigger. Yeah, so it evens out the delay. So it evens out the delay. So the 10 millisecond guy doesn't look like 10 milliseconds anymore. It might look like 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, and 500 milliseconds. I mm -hmm. still does with 500 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. When you run the AQM, just because you took out the cumulus, aspect, the RTT difference between the flows is a lot of fire. And yeah. that's probably why that happens, right? That, that, how that do you is, drop? That is definitely quite a bit But you do so, see the even out uh, drops as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Like, what, what you're saying is, yeah. yeah, it's like a 50 to 1 ratio, but then they'll get like much more equalized when you, uh, when you actually let the fight full build up. Mm -hmm. you know, that guy becomes 600 milliseconds, the other guy becomes 100 and something milliseconds. Yeah. So now it's like a 5, 6 to 1 ratio. So yeah, we can try normalizing that against that. Um, data against that. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's, that's, that's what I would guess. Mm -hmm. my, 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 I hate to keep that scene too much. Mm -hmm. One, uh, 500 milliseconds is two times around the Earth, um, so I don't care. <laughs> 250 milliseconds is good enough. So we fix everything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the, uh, the specific application I had in mind for 500 milliseconds was satellite. <laughs> so yeah. for for that graph, I'm also sort of well, same question that we'll come across and. Have you looked at the uh, uh, SNMP counters on the sender and see if the 500 millisecond flows are actually getting more, say, renal recoveries from um, by having those AQMs in the network? Because it could Is be that case more, that what, more, say, recoveries and you know timeouts and fast retransmits and so on. Like if you if you look yes, at those, yes, uh, I've I've looked at the TCP um, trace of packet counts and these things. And that's why I, where, I came, where the um, spacing out of drop came from. So we don't see necessarily timeouts in either of them. Uh, but what we see is uh, you'll get three or four drops, and then a longer period of no drops, and then three or four drops for the FIFO, whereas for the HRM, you'll see one drop every quite evenly spaced, actually. Um, so, 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 so that's that's where the where that came from. But the the whole thing is um, the packet traces and data files and everything is available online. If um, if 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 you want to look at it more, I don't um, have them with me now, but there's some links at the at the end. Right. 
Uh, moving on to the octave part, um, the transient behavior. And these are similar to the, uh, to the example you saw at the, at the beginning. It's the same kind of a graph, but these are all of them. So uh, after five seconds, the computer does start up, and this is the development of instantaneous uh, latency measurements over, over time. And as you would expect, Python, Python grows up and stays there. Um, the scheduling algorithms don't really care whatsoever. They just put them in their own queue and, and carry on. AWET pretty quickly um, hits its scratch target. It is rather aggressive. And then the Pi takes a little while, comes down. Cuddle takes quite a while, goes quite high up, and then takes almost uh, 25, 20, 20 to 30 seconds to <coughs> come back down. And at 10 minute megabits per second, you see the same thing, except it's worse. And what you actually see here is pi um, going above microfax. And the reason why you can do that is because pi doesn't have the same heart limit on the Q side, because the drop mechanism is, is AQM. So it's supposed to drop them before it gets that high, but it doesn't. And then for about 10 seconds, you actually get worse behavior than um, microfax. And the same thing as before, both cut and high takes. 10, 20, 30 seconds, not really seconds, seconds to um, to keep to get latency back to where we want it to be. And if this happens while you're on the phone, uh, your power calls are probably going to drop. And the same thing at, at one megabit per second. So that's the reason why this is um, this is called the up. And this is something, especially um, if you have things like varying bandwidth, Wi-Fi, and so on. If if, if if it takes that long for the AQMs to react, then something is wrong. And <coughs> is that all theoretical data or actual data? From uh, it's actual data run over the um, five computers networked together. We remember in Linux. Um, yeah. So summing up, the good steady state behavior. You can actually get significantly better latency on the road with these AQMs. Fast tuning can get even more so, and the cardal algorithm does have some issues at 100 megabits per second. Interflow fairness, AQMs, for whatever reason, tends to exacerbate TCP R to T on fairness, and fast tuning uh, does achieve almost perfect fairness in these instances. And then the octave part, the transient behavior, AQMs can take up to tens of seconds to contain latency at a uh, competing flow startup. And the FQI rooms that really missed. Any uh, questions about the results before we move on? Apart from what we've already asked. Right. Okay, so um, I'm going to speak a little bit about this uh, NetPub wrapper testing tool that I've used for this. So, um, what happened was that these I started trying to run these experiments and figured out that uh, I thought, of course, you can just run them manually one tool at a time and then collect the data and put them into something and graph it. And then it turned out, okay, you actually need to run two tests at the same time or three or tools. And I started building shell scripts and I started trying to glue things together with that and keep track of stuff. And then at some point I gave up and, and thought, oh, back, I let's just put the whole thing into Python. And uh, thus, NetPub Wrapper was born. And then I happened to show it to Dave at some point, and he started requesting features and using it. And suddenly, um, it grew. And what this does, it's basically it's a Python wrapper for running tests with other tools. Uh, it's, it mainly does NetPub, hence the name, but it's grown to include things like DITG, just ping, uh, there's a HTTP tool that goes with it, and so on. So if anyone has suggestions for a better name, uh, I'm all ears. But um, it runs it, these tools in console. You can specify test files, and it will pass the output and store it in a common JSON-based format. It will store metadata along with the test results. It will even automatically gather metadata if you let it from your machine, so you can keep track of how your queues are configured, how your interfaces are configured, all these sorts of things. And it has batch facilities, so it can run tests for you, and you can give it to the thing uh, for three weeks until your hard drive shows up. But I just did. Um, and then it has grown various plots. All the plots you've seen today have, have been produced by this tool. Um, there's simple single flow tests, including ping, TCP, upload, download, UDP floods, the latency and the load tests with one flow up and down, the rule variant, various sorts, 
periodic GDP bursts, on-off TCP flows, well, RTT balance tests that compare different, compare different TCP mm -hmm. algorithms if you can over that view, and there's some application specific tests. So these are all sort of specified in the tool, and some of them you can run. And what I usually do, I have it on my laptop, and um, whenever I come to a new network, like here, I can like rerun it and try to blow up the Wi-Fi and see what happens. And usually it's pretty bad, but actually uh, here it's been pretty good. The case of fair queuing is in use here, I go from the trace. And there's no uh, actual AQM by either. I'm observing 200 milliseconds delay on the TCP flows. Um, 10 milliseconds delay for the measurement flows, 200 for the TCP. Still a lot better than most places I've been. Yeah, um, so, so it's basically like have it as a, as a canned thing you can run this. I find that's useful in terms of the kind of thing that is weird, but, uh, <laughs> but then you can also do it to do things like I've done here in the test bed. And this is uh, a, a section of the Python that specifies the test. It's basically try to make it declarative. So this is just a dictionary that you specify. You want this this net perf stream test with these markings at, starting at this delay. <coughs> and then you want simultaneously this TCP stream test at this delay. And then you want <coughs> a computed average from these values. And then um, about 10 more stanzas of this, and you have the rule list. And then there's a separate section where you specify how to plot it. Um, this you probably can't read. Uh, it's a part of the JSON output where a lot of the metadata is gathered. So there's the Ethernet driver here, there's uh, the link parameters, MAC address, next top IP, whether or not you have upload, offloads on your Q disk, your source and target, your gateways, your IP addresses. Uh, and the same thing here is remotely gathered from the bottom box of the screen the, uh, the SSH section. Uh, and of course, you can turn this off if you don't want to broadcast your IP and Mac address to the world and you share the data. Files. And this is the batch facility. It's basically an ini file with a sort of recursive variables expansion feature, um, and then uh, some looping where you can you can specify commands that you want to run uh, before or after each test, and to run them and abort if things don't work. And then you can loop over different arguments to specify clearly if you want. Uh, and this is a um, fairly simple mechanism that actually allows you to, to run lots of tests at once. And then it has a, a GUI for exploring some of the data sets and um, how are we on time. I could actually do a, uh, I come back and do a, a live demo and show you some of, some of these things and what to come to the rest if you don't have too many questions in the use of time. Um, but you can sort of open up data files and compare them and just flip through them and, and this sort of thing to do some um, interactive exploration of your data, which I find useful. So, the last thing I want to talk a little bit about is some of the also unsolved problems in this area. There's two, in, in two sort of groups. One is in, in the research uh, direction. Some of these, uh, especially the AQM algorithms, are designed to be parameterless, but maybe they're not so much actually parameterless. You do have to tune them to some inferences and depending on your link characteristics and so on. So there's definitely more research that can be put into trying to actually come up with an algorithm where you can just turn it on anywhere and it will make the world perfect. Um, then as you saw the transient behavior, and as I mentioned before, once you go into things where you have biology, Varying bandwidths on orders of milliseconds, perhaps, in the case of wireless, um, you're going to have to want something to, to want something that reacts faster than we have currently. It's definitely something to be done there. Wireless is a whole different can of worms for various other reasons that I'm sure you can have Dave talk to you about at great length. Um, but, but, but the algorithms is also, is also part of it. Then there's the whole thing about vanish queuing. Do you actually, um, are, there, are there places where you don't want them? Um, they impose some characteristics in your traffic that might not work for you. Um, even though, as you see here, they, they, for, for these, these sorts of scenarios, they work quite well. So there's this, there might be some more worth looking into some more of, do we actually want vanish queuing everywhere? Do we not want it at all? What, what, in which scenarios is this actually Then we have some operative or more sort of yeah, not so much research, perhaps, but yeah, I'm, I'm calling them operative unsolved problems. One of them is the very basic storing and indexing of this test data. It would be nice to have some sort of online repository where people can run tests on their 
on the network things and, and have it uploaded and can browse it and, and compare with others and so on. And maybe also make the tests a bit easier to run. Even though you have these kind of tests, you still have to run them from the command line. So having something like speed test or run in the browser and do something more intelligent than just measuring your bandwidth and then measuring your pain. This it would be nice. The problem, convincing the world that this is actually worth running, uh, that's an ongoing thing. It's getting there. Um, there's also standardization. Consistency. Uh, Yes, uh, as far as deployment is concerned, it's been turned on. FQ Trouble has been the default in uh, in OpenWRT for a while now. Uh, the new barrier break release has it on by default. Uh, the system D um, in its system ships with a country file to turn it on by default now. Uh, Fedora is probably going to, to use that, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things happening in the deployment world, but it's a, it's a slow process. And then standardization, trying to get this algorithm. There's an ongoing effort in the IETF, trying to get the algorithms described and get them through and so on. Some links. I'm going to uh, send you the slides, but there's some links to some of these things and some references to the algorithms and so on. So, yeah, questions? All right, demo. <laughs> I have to keep depressing. We have tens or even hundreds of thousands of data sets now, but they're pretty small. When you get investment, it's like 40K. So compared to shipping pack factors around, it's much more efficient. And they're all comparable. Um, so there's, he has, I don't know, tens of thousands. I have hundreds of thousands of these sets. And certainly the indexing and classification part of it is giving us a couple the last week. Results in the interim. It's awesome. <laughs> I used to have to fiddle for hours with the new plot and other tools in order just to get a simple plot done. And what he's capable of doing is taking. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So this, what I've done is I've taken. When you say it's comparable, is it comparable to what? What do you mean? To Java. You can run different tests. And run different tests. So the results are comparable. Yeah, so if you get a result and you give a Wi-Fi link and you have somebody else, you have a result from the previous coffee shop, <laughs> you can compare them. You have somebody else's results, and it makes it really easy. Okay. Anyway, you're doing demo on Tokyo. So this is, uh, I've loaded in uh, uh, one run for each of the algorithms, and they get um, tapped, and then you can sort of flip through them. And um, what you probably want to do is you want to scale them to the same um, Access and then you can sort of flip through your results and see how they behave and see some differences. Um, and you can also, these are also here you can see over the, the over time development of some of those. So you can see that uh, an atrium like Cuddle will have a very flat sort of um, average throughput, but the individual flows will, will go up and down. Whereas the uh, the F the current current algorithms are very very flat and very smooth, um, and then the difference here between FQ no cuddle and cuddle, you can see the each of these spikes is sort of in a it's a two pick uh, TCP up and down thing, so so it's a basically a double packet drop where it goes down and then goes back up, and you can see these um, where the uh, where the HM makes it a bit smoother, and of course the latency station keeps flat down here. I feel fast. All of the place, high latency, high SFQ. Then you can say, oh, now I want to look at a CDF of the different things. Do that to you. you filter out the latency and you get the differences here. And then you can compare your different, your different flows. You can even do a. Um, so the bandwidth up, um, up down plot. Yeah, I'm going to go to so this thing, the box plot of the different. Algorithms. So these are the um, total downloads, total uploads, and the total things. So you can easily compare different variables. And if you want to compare only two of them, then this thing will tell you that uh, SFQ and would compare SFQ and ABET. And if they were the same, they would be on the blue line there. But here you can see that uh, that you get. Higher values to this. 
And the pass, there is no value. Okay, so just hinge to upload. That's all of them. So that gets a good bit. Uh, so now all these are. How about the ellipse plot? Uh, when you can do the ellipsis plot, which is what you had before. This is configured a bit, a bit differently. So these work best if you load, if you do them to aggregate, because this this does statistics and individual measurement points. So you get weird results. Whereas you you want the um, aggregate the whole test and aggregate it with that. And you need to fiddle it a bit more. That doesn't necessarily work well in the GUI. Um, you can also say, oh, I want them on the separate plots, which doesn't make sense like this. So. And that one. That's a bit too many there, but you can get them about each other and these. Um, yeah, and then there's a meter data browser here down here where you can go to Google the meter data. That's concluded the demo. I guess open source. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's on GitHub. Send me back reports if you want to use it. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Let's Thank you. Thank you.